Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining this evening. Uh, tonight is one in a series of webinars that we have where we are looking at calf pneumonia. Uh, and we've got an expert panel of speakers that we've been having throughout the last couple of weeks as part of our calf campaign. If you guys are joining live tonight, hopefully you received one of our delegate uh, packs in the post. This would have contained a calf thermometer, a calf maximum and minimum thermometer, and it also would have uh, had a copy of our brand new calf housing guide and our calf uh, health scorecard. If you are watching this on YouTube uh, as a as sort of a catch up, make sure you do hit the subscribe button, but do feel free to send us an email and we can get a copy of those resources sent out to you. Uh, we also do have a new Instagram page, so if you'd like to give us a like and a share there, and we'd love to see some photos of people being able to use their resources on farm, uh, show us where those thermometers are and whether or not you're using that calf health scorecard. Uh, well, just a little bit of housekeeping then before we start the rest of this evening. Um, all attendees are muted throughout this webinar. Uh, we are going to be recording this and this will go onto YouTube afterwards. Um, up on the top screen, uh, you can see a little orange arrow. This is for asking questions. So just ask as many questions. Uh, we'll hopefully get to them all this evening. And if there's anything that we don't get to, feel free to send me an email afterwards and hopefully we can cover that. Uh, but on to sort of tonight's presentation, uh, I am joined by Dr. Tim Potter from Vet Partners and we are going to be covering calf pneumonia and antimicrobials and the use of NSAIDs or anti-inflammatories on a farm. Uh, pneumonia is one of the leading causes of death on all beef and dairy farms uh, and it's costing the industry around about £50 million pounds annually. Uh, it hits us quite hard, bottom line, as farmers and it also contributes to quite a large proportion of antibiotics that are used on farm. So this evening with Tim, we're going to have a bit of a holistic overview, recap on some of the topics from the previous webinars uh, that we've had with other experts during the week. We're going to be looking at how we can diagnose uh, pneumonia on farm, making sure that we can correctly diagnose it, then we can use the correct antibiotics. We're also going to touch on the use of anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs and how these can be used to help aid in recovery. Um, and then we're also going to be sort of having a bit of a, an overview recap of how we can approach pneumonia. It is a multifactorial disease and we're going to be looking at how you need to be looking at not just one area in terms of treatment on farm uh, and hopefully with Tim we're going to be able to cover that. So Tim, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much, Laura, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, great overview there of what I've been covering. Suddenly, it sort of sounds like a mammoth task to go through for the next um, 45 minutes, an hour or so. Um, so yeah, I'm a vet in practice. I work primarily with calf areas across the country. Um, so in my um, history prior to coming into practice, I did a PhD which was focused purely on calf pneumonia and actually how we design the dosing regimes for antibiotics to treat that condition. So that's where my interest comes from in this area. Um, so if you're happy, Laura, I'll kick off and we will um, we'll, we'll get going. Um, as Laura said, happy to take um, questions as we go through, just but if you put them in the chat, then Laura will see that either ask them at the time or we will um, review them at the end. Um, let's see, we are just, I suppose Laura alluded to the, the challenge that we have with pneumonia and where it currently sits and that big impact it has on the performance um, of the animals under our care. And I suppose if we look through where we've come from and sort of where we are currently, we are in this sort of weird situation where actually respiratory disease, much as we've got new technology coming in, we've got great new um, antibiotics and medicines coming in, we still see this disease as a major challenge. And unfortunately, we are still at that point where actually the, the number of cases that we see and probably the mortality associated with it still hasn't dropped significantly over the last 45 years. And I think one of the things, where when I go around farm and I like the people that really make a success in terms of managing this disease um, view it holistically and and I think that's the key thing and that's the key um, key message for tonight much as we're focusing on the treatment the treatment ultimately the horse has bolted we are at that situation where we want to prevent those cases in the first place and whatever treatment we give, we want it to work, but at the end of the day, the best thing is prevention is going to be better. So it is really important that we look focused on this disease um, in a holistic manner. So thinking about the preventative strategies, 
making sure that we are rapidly detecting disease when it does occur because this disease is so multifactorial there are so many risk factors so many pathogens that can cause it that ultimately we are going to be at a point where it's constantly going to be there as a potential disease so it's important that we detect it rapidly and then when we do detect it what are we doing about it what are those treatment protocols that we're putting into place and how do we optimize those and that's very much the focus of what we're going to be talking about today um, so when we consider that individual calf and um, what's going on with there? There's a number of things at, at play there. So we have to think about what's going on with that animal. How is that animal able to fight disease? Because if we look at the list of um, disease-causing pathogens and sort of the organisms that can cause pneumonia, half of them are already there naturally in that animal. So we think about the bacteria. If I went out onto a any farm, healthy calf, took samples from the nasal passages of of that calf, I would likely find bacteria there that potentially could cause pneumonia so they're there normally and what we're in a situation is is that actually when we have a disease outbreak or we have those cases of pneumonia something's gone wrong something has meant that those bacteria have been able to multiply have been able to move from the nasal passages down into the lungs and cause disease so immunity is a big thing there that we need to think about how do we ensure the best possible immunity of that calf and hey it would be irresponsibly of me to talk about calves and calf health without talking about colostrum and that's always going to be the first step in boosting immunity but as we go to later in life it's going to be how do we manage stress how do we manage the sort of um, the health of that animal through ensuring best nutrition and minimizing the risk of disease environment's going to be a big piece there and we've seen through presentations throughout this week so far about the importance of environment and i will mention some of those as we go through this sort of quick recap and that's there as a risk factor, either for stressing the animal out and sort of causing that sort of um, that animal bit to be become more susceptible to disease, or it's going to be that risk factor in terms of exposing the animal to diseases. So if we've got a dirty environment or that animal is in close proximity to other animals that can potentially spread disease, we're more likely to see pneumonia. And that's where the sort of the pathogen comes in. So those disease causing organisms, they have to come from somewhere. So they may be already there in the, the nasal passages of that calf and therefore actually that suppression immunity allows them to overgrow or we might be introducing them through mixing um, animals sharing airspace and so those coming in so it is this real kind of um, sort of interaction between number of different risk factors there that we have to be aware of and when we think about minimizing the risk of pneumonia what are we trying to do what are our the sort of the two pillars of that and i suppose what we want to do with everything that we're sort of focused on is increasing the the ability of the animal to fight disease and also then decreasing the level of disease challenge so i am preparing that art that animal to face the challenge of disease make it less susceptible but i also then want to reduce the challenge because if the animal doesn't have immunity it's going to be I, I can put a small disease challenge to it and it's likely to, to, to succumb. Whereas actually, if I can boost the animal's immunity, make sure it's in the fist, fittest sense, uh, sort of possible state, it's going to be more capable of fighting disease and therefore be able to stay, sort of almost overcome a larger disease challenge. So when we think about how do I boost that, that animal's immunity, it starts with colostrum. So making sure that animal gets the, the passive immunity through colostrum. Think about how we can reduce stress. So when we come to any management procedures, be that weaning, be that castration, be that disbudding, how do we make sure those, those sort of events are as less stress, stress sort of related as possible? Make sure we've got proper nutrition. Nutrition is there for growth, but actually if we restrict the nutrition of the animal, it's not getting what it's going to need. It's going to, that will also have a negative impact on the calf's immunity, and it's going to be more likely to succumb to disease. And then we can actively improve the immunity of the animal, so through vaccination. And we've heard through this week about sort of the possibilities around vaccine um, sort of protocols. On the flip side, what do we also want to do? We want to reduce the challenge. So getting the environment right. So thinking about 
that good ventilation, which is going to be especially important for um, respiratory disease, reducing commingling. So again, trying to reduce that sort of that pathogen circle on that previous diagram where we're going to go actually if we don't ming mingle the animals with other other stock of different ages or from different sources they're less likely to come across pathogens making sure we've got the right space allowance so again reducing stress less likely for disease transfer and then also thinking about if we are going to get disease how easy can we observe those animals how easy can we handle to treat them because we want to make sure that actually we're getting in treated treating early because within a group of animals if that animal is left untreated suddenly that disease is going to spread very rapidly through a group so we need to make sure that we're on 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 top of that um, disease detection and that disease management so this is not a lecture about the environment, but I think the key things where to, to think about with your environment and just to recap some of the stuff that we've had through um, previous lectures this week is going, think about what you're doing in terms of providing the correct temperature. And for those of you that pre-registered, that's ultimately what that sort of the thermometer is in there for you so that you've got that maximum, you've got that idea of what the environment's doing. And especially as we go into winter, thinking about those younger calves where, ultimately anything sort of sub 12 15 degrees those animals are going to be t diverting more energy to keeping warm so that's going to be away from being that growth and also potentially more stressful and they're more likely to succumb to disease so having an idea about that temperature is going to be really important for you to sort of think about how can i actively manage my animals managing the moisture so if we've got a dry environment bugs the, the pathogens being breathed out by animals are less likely to survive, so they're less likely to be then transmitted onto other animals, so we stop that spread. Fresh air, again, if the breathed out pathogens, the bugs that go breathing out from these animals, if it goes into fresh air, they're going to die very rapidly, so less likely to be picked up. Controlling draft, so we're ultimately, again, making a correct in environment for the animal. We're not stressing them out. We're not diverting energy to keep warm. and that hygiene piece and yes pneumonia is much more about a, a sort of airborne disease it's not like scours where we've got that sort of fecal oral contamination but hygiene is still important because if we're putting calves into a dirty environment they're fighting disease over here in terms of scours we're more likely to see pneumonia as well so we have to think holistically about how we are controlling disease on our farms and how they interact so ensuring you've got good hygiene is going to be really important as well um, Tim, just jumping in really quickly there, that, that point, the first one where you were talking about temperature, um, sort of for those that, that would have received a delegate pack with a thermometer, when sort of monitoring the temperature within their own calf shed or, or sort of calf housing, where do you think is best uh, place to be putting that thermometer in terms of getting an accurate, I see your face laughing there, but uh, just to get, to make sure that you're getting, I guess, a true representation of um, the temperature change. Yeah, and, and that's a really good question, Laura. I, I suppose the best thing to do, and I, I wasn't meaning to laugh about it, I suppose what we actually do is what are we trying to gauge? We're trying to gauge what the temperature is, where the calves are. So it is thinking about going, right, actually put it somewhere almost in a pen. So actually, if you've got a side wall in the pen, somewhere where you can see it and observe it is always going to make sense because I don't want you to tuck it away into a corner where you're never going to look at it. But don't put it the other side of the feeding passage or the other side of the work area away from the calves where it might be in a draft or you've got lots of sort of concrete around it put it closer to where the calves are out of reach of the calves where they can't get it but you want it to be as close as possible to where the calves are because then it will give you the most accurate um, um, sort of reading because we all know and the number of sheds I go into where you chat to people people know which which pens are going to be colder there's variation within a shed so try and put it somewhere Close, as close as possible to sort of the calf environment to give you the best best readings but make it accessible because if you tuck it away at the back of a pen you're not going to regularly walk over and check it it's a sort of it's that kind of fine balance you want the accurate information but we want it to be in a usable place and we've actually had another question just come in too about the correct temperature so what is sort of the ideal temperature we want within our calf housing yeah and it, i suppose 
there's not necessarily an ideal temperature because I think we we would challenge it's difficult and I think we're we're not at a stage where we're probably going to actively heat our calf sheds I suppose what we we're really being aware of is that for those young calves and again it will depend a little bit on the age so if we're talking pre-weaned calves where we've got calves that are they're not yet ruminants they're eating a diet which is very rapidly digestible they're going to be very susceptible to cold is that ultimately probably their their lower critical temperature so the temperature at which they are going to be actively sort of burning more energy just to keep warm is going to be about 12 to sort of 12 degrees so we can make that worse by putting them in a draft so suddenly you know what that will drop it down like they will suddenly feel the cold even more you may get, get them moist and sort of put them into a wet conditions again it will be it will sort of really impact it so it's not about a um, a sort of target temperature it's being aware that actually those small calves are going to burn energy to keep keep warm at anything less than 12 degrees so at that point it's then going right how do I provide an environment for them that is then going to keep them out of draft so deep bedding allowing them to nest um, make sure we haven't got drafts coming underneath doors keep the the sort of the fluid under control but it's also thinking that actually as that temperature is dropping off do I feed them more because if I want if I'm setting out um the sort of my targets for growth rates. If I suddenly got a drop in temperature, that calf is going to be burning more energy to keep warm. So actually it's going to be harder for it to keep that growth up. So it may just be a case that actually in the colder weather, you you give it a bit more food. And certainly we would have a number of farms that we work with that would actually just go over to a winter feeding plan where you go, okay, we know that we can't heat this shed. So what's the alternative in that cold weather? I just give that calf that bit more food so that actually we know that we can meet that that requirement for the energy for it to keep warm. Does that answer your question, Laura? Yeah, it does. Thanks, Tim. Perfect. So just a couple more slides on the environment and say ventilation comes is one of the key things that we've got in terms of that pneumonia control. And it's going to be that key thing that everyone um, talks about. And why are we interested? That removes stuff coming out of the calf. So be that heat. So if they're a larger stock and we're getting to a point where we don't, we want to avoid heat stress, we want to get rid of the water vapor coming out. We want to get the pathogens that they're breathing out, but also dust and other gases. Um, and we want that ventilation. Good ventilation is about a uniform distribution of air. So we don't want draft at animal level. We want that just a fresh air coming through. And we want that that sort of correct airspeed. So when we're talking about drafts, think of it as a walking pace. So actually, a draft for a calf actually is anything at above about two meters per second. So actually, which isn't very fast. So it is being aware that doors open and those kind of things actually will have a negative impact on the on, on the calf. And that ventilation just provides the fresh air, which just limits the ability of the the pathogens to hang around in the environment. And We'll have heard a lot more about inlets and outlets, and I'd encourage you to have a look at the other presentations that have been recorded on this topic. But if you're looking at your sheds, key things is always going to be your inlet. So where's your fresh air coming from? And we want that to be about four times the amount of um, outlet we have. And don't rely on opening and closing doors because it's quite often people talk about, all right, when it's the, the, it gets stuffy, I'll open a door. We need fresh air coming in all the time. And I think that's the key thing to bear in mind is that we want there to be a constant supply of fresh air. So if the only opening into your shed is a door that is closed at times because of the weather, then you're never going to have enough inlet. So and think about your shed design, long thin sheds, inlets at either end are great, very close by, but that middle of the shed is going to be very sort of still and not get fresh air. So don't rely on the gable ends. And as I said, that inlet needs to be above calf level. In terms of your outlet, Rough guide, hey, about four meters, 0.04 meters squared per animals up to 100 kilos. So, um, and exact figures will depend on the so stocking density and the roof pitch. But think about it if you look up at your um, your ridge of your shed and 0.04 meters squared for 100 kilos, it's probably looking at a 20 centimeter gap, roughly, along the length of most sheds. So, that's what you're looking at in terms of. Um, outlet and yes 
that increases the risk of water ingress and sort of so we think need to think about how we cap it or have raised sort of protected ridges on it but that's the count kind of outlet that we need to really drive their movement and i think we unfortunately see a lot of cranked ridges out there it's a sort of that sort of cheap solution that's often sold and it's never enough in terms of sort of the um, the outlet and it's it's really interesting sort of i think we've definitely got moving away from that in terms of when grants are going out for building design for livestock I they, they're never going to be um, looked at in a positive light anymore so that's your environment we've talked about that let's really focus on the disease at hand so pneumonia if I was to do a poll right now, and we're not going to do it because I think it's 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 everyone would turn around and say they know exactly what they're looking for for signs of pneumonia. And I think most people would be able to come up with a list like um, what I've got here of the sort of different signs. And some of those you will look at and you'll say, OK, yeah, that's really specific for pneumonia or respiratory disease. So you start thinking nasal discharge. So if we've got yellow um mucus coming out the nose of a calf it sort of it really instantly points to a disease in the of the lungs and the respiratory system similarly by coughing or increased respiratory rate or animals that are really struggling to breathe they're instantly recognizable as pneumonia but it's also worth remembering that some of it and certainly in the early stages of the disease it might be less um less specific so we may have temperatures, so actually that animal may have dropped off its food a little bit. You take its temperature, and that may be elevated, but you may not necessarily see overt signs of pneumonia. Um, and so there's a long list of the signs of pneumonia that we we can see, and I would encourage. And when you start looking at how you're identifying pneumonia on farm, don't think of pneumonia as hey that calf that is open mouth breathing really struggling to breathe there's pneumonia and a cough is just a cough ultimately they're all part of the sort of symptoms of pneumonia and i think one of the challenges we have in terms of managing this disease is sort of not necessarily accelerate celery tolerating that sort of that low grade disease and i'd encourage you if you've got teams of people looking after the stock or the calves or however it works on your farm is make sure that you all uh, have almost have that discussion and agree what you mean by a calf with pneumonia. What signs are you looking for? What is it that is going to get you to pull that animal out, have a look at it, take its temperature and actually treat it and make sure everyone's on the same page? Because I think we are moving to, this is a disease that as a vet, I know majority of it, the diagnosis will be done on farm and farmers will be treating um, based on them identifying it. But it's then important that the entire team is knowing what they're looking for and when they're treated. Um, Tim, we just had one question come in actually in relation to that list. And someone actually asked how long after an infection, pneumonia infection, would the calf exhibit or start to exhibit a rough coat or a dull coat? So, yeah, and, and I think rough coats, dull coats, I think it it's very difficult to put a specific time um, timeline on any of the symptoms there and actually we're not dealing with a set factory line as sort of you know what there's no there's no specific um, timeline for some of it I think the way I look at the rough coat that poorer um, the sort of poorer weight gains and poorer intakes is some of that is that may not be the sort of those animals that are um, acutely affected so actually sort of in that sort of early stage of the disease they may be ones that have had disease previously and then are still still um, either have got long-term damage to the lungs or have got recurrent cases and they've gone into that chronic stage so the rough coats and the sort of people I think often is sort of it's often a little bit later but it, I wouldn't put a specific time on it um, I look at it more of a if I'm looking at a group of calves, I'm looking at it going, right, have we got coughs and with other signs of active infections, but also that sort of, if we've got poor performance or I look at a group of calves where we have, they're all the same age, but we have that variability in size. If you're at the point where we're seeing variability in size of those animals, that again points to the fact that there's been some kind of disease issue and it may not be pneumonia, but the fact that you've got what's checking some animals and not checking others. So it's all about that kind of that holistic picture and sort of following them through through the disease. So we had the long list of symptoms there and 
if we start looking more internally in the animal, what's going on and what, what's causing some of the challenges is that we're really interested in lung consolidation. So pneumonia, it's causing damage to the lungs. And what we end up is that those lungs are there for gas exchange. They're there, they're the, sort of the source of oxygen for the animal. And consolidation, when we talk about that for pneumonia, is that we're talking about an area of the lung that would be normally hey, full of air. It's now full of liquid. In most cases for pneumonia, that's going to be sort of much more pus-like, but in the early stages, it will be sort of more sort of mucus-like. But we get that sort of filling of the, those, those airways, and that's going to obstruct air movement. So that's why we see animals struggling to breathe. That's ultimately what potentially kills them alongside sort of other parts of the infection. And if we look at this picture here, um, the consolidated area on the on the picture is the darker um, darker tissue. So that sort of almost looks a bit more like liver, much darker in color, firmer in texture. And that is much, if you were to feel it, doesn't feel as spongy. It's much more sort of fluid filled and sort of really solid. And so we've got compromised gas exchange in those areas. And we can have an acute reaction that causes this and then that can um, resolve over time. But if, if we get sort of longer term damage, Actually, this can persist because we got sort of fibrosis. We get sort of um, the hyperplasis of the tissue sort of multiplies in those areas, and actually, we just that that tissue never re returns to function. And the healthy lung is going to be the area at the bottom of that that photo. So that lighter colour. Um, if you were to feel it, it would feel spongy. If you were to cut a piece off and throw it into a bucket of water, it would float. And that's because it's well aerated. It's, we've got lots of air in there. It's thinking of what do we want the lungs to do? They want their our, our way of bringing air into the body. And if you want to know more about the sort of the pathology of it and understanding a bit more of the postmortem, quick plug for tomorrow's webinar where they will be going through this, this sort of aspect in a bit more detail and going into a, um, a few more information about that sort of pathology that goes on. So what's the impact of that? consolidation or lung damage because as Laura alluded to at the beginning in the introduction this is a big impact of a disease on productivity. Um, this graph here shows um, some some data from some animals so these were veal animals sent to, sent to um, that were monitored live weight at 182 days and um, at slaughter they then looked at whether or not they had consolidation in, in their lungs and what we can see there, the green animals, those are animals with, when they looked at the lungs, there was no evidence of consolidation, no evidence of lung damage. And the average weight of those animals was 230 kilos. When we started seeing that darker tissue, that sort of areas of consolidation or evidence of damage, a moderate amount, so maybe one or two areas on the, on the lung, we suddenly see the average weight of those animals drop down to about 214 kilos. And the red group on this graph, where it, it's sort of those ones where you, the lungs looked very similar to that previous slide, so sort of more about half of the lungs showing lung consolidation or damage, we're suddenly down to the point where we've got the average weight of that group is 170, 78 kilos. So we've almost lost 50 kilos worth of growth, um, and that's linked in to the damaged lungs there that's going to have an impact on the performance. So really significant. And if we look at that data a bit differently, one of the challenges that we have about pneumonia, and much as I said in that slide where we listed the symptoms, everyone knows what they're looking for with pneumonia. One of the challenges we have is that actually our detection of this disease isn't as great as we would love it to be. It's, it is, we're dealing with animals that don't necessarily always show exactly the same symptoms. Same way I answered the question about rough hair coats in a slightly obtuse manner was the fact that there isn't a set way that those animals present. There isn't a set timeline. We're dealing with a prey animal, so their reaction is ultimately normally to try and um, hold themselves in a healthy state, so they don't always show um, symptoms unless we sort of really look for them. And that can cause an real issue in terms of um, detection. So this graph is the same animals that we had on the previous slide, but grouped based on whether or not they had had treatment at any point during their lifetime for pneumonia. 
So we had full rec full access to the records. We could look back and we could say, okay, these animals were treated, these animals were untreated. And so color coded the same way. So green is absolutely healthy lungs. The sort of yellowy orange are those animals that had had sort of some evidence of damage. The red is the sort of severe, severe damage. And so if we look on, on the, the left column, we've got a green green area there. So those are animals that had, had been treated. They've obviously been treated. They've no longer have symptoms or signs of, of damage in the lungs. So they've responded to that treatment really well. So those are almost our successes. Those are our success stories. Those are all those animals that we've treated. I'm happy with how they've responded. There's no long-term damage and actually um, animals done okay. We then in that same left-hand graph, we have the orange and the red areas. And those are ultimately animals that received treatment, but then when they came to slaughter still had evidence of lung damage. So those are animals that are either had had follow-up cases that maybe not picked up, or those are animals that hadn't responded completely to our treatment. And I suppose when we look at those, if we're being really self-critical about it, is going, did we pick them up early enough? Did we get the treatment? Was the treatment as, as effective as it could have been? So there's an opportunity there. It's going, right, how could I increase the effectiveness of the treatment and how do I make sure that we reduce that group? If we look at the right-hand side of the, um, the graph, so that column, those are animals that never had any treatment through their life. So going through all the medicines records, these animals at no point had had treatment for pneumonia. So we've got 60% of them never treated, no evidence of lung damage. Hey, well done, we're happy with those. That, that's, that's where we would like that graph to look like. The top part of that graph, so the red and the orange, are, those are animals that had no history of treatment, so they'd never been treated for pneumonia, but at slaughter had evidence of lung damage. So we've got 40% of animals that had some kind of pathology, some kind of damage to their lungs that we had not picked up through normal visual assessment and of those animals and just a normal sort of observation. So those are those animals that if we being critical again, did we miss them? Those are the ones that we missed, potentially missed signs of pneumonia. They've got damage in their lungs. And it's thinking about, right, how do I prevent that group going forward? And I suppose that's where the, the challenge really comes in terms of how do we improve detection? And I suppose throw the, throw the question to the group and you can type your um, responses in chat. It'd be really interesting to know how people are going about observing animals for pneumonia? Are people using scoring systems like the ones that we've got on the, on the, on the um, slide here? Are they using any technology for it? Or are they just doing spending time observing them? Because I think this is a really key area. If we, if we consider how do we detect it, that's the first step before we get to the treatment. So if you're happy to stick in the chat anything that you've got in terms of what you're currently doing in, um, for disease detection. Um, it would be really interesting to, to know. Um, Tim, sorry, I've got another question that came in actually. Um, from a couple of slides ago, you we obviously were looking at your graphs and your data uh, to do with loss of daily live weight gain. What evidence and research do you have uh, relating, I suppose, in terms of the dairy side, uh, in terms of lactation? So is there much evidence out there in terms of uh, re reduction in yield in heifers uh, who have obviously suffered with pneumonia? Yeah, so so absolutely, Laura. And I, have to be careful here this is where i misquote the sort of the actual figures out but certainly when we start looking animals that have had a case of pneumonia um in in the rearing phase we we certainly see significant drop um in milk yield in that in their first lactation and we actually see it again also in their second lactation so those animals are much less likely to fill um, fulfill their potential and there's some quite nice studies where we see that sort of that impact in first and second lactation they're more also more likely to be culled out, so they're less, they're sort of their increased risk um, of succumbing to other disease and more likely to be culled. So I think what do they put a long-term cost? Um, there's costs of about in the mid 700, so about 750 pounds for a case of 
um, pneumonia in a dairy heifer is that potential long-term impact on it. And that's if we start factoring in that, that impact that that disease has on that animal's likelihood of leaving the herd plus the, the loss production. And some of the figures are quite frightening when you start thinking about people are talking sort of, hey, 500 litres plus sort of drop in lactation in the first, um, um, that first lactation because of the sort of that, the impact that um, that pneumonia has had. And that will be in part to, hey, impact on growth rates and everything else. But it is that sort of, they, that case will have long reaching impacts in the dairy herd. Well, we've got a couple of uh, answers coming in. So obviously someone has said that at university they were recommended to use the Wisconsin scoring system, which you've got obviously a slide up there showing that. Uh, another attendee has said that they use a one to three scoring system looking at the whole picture of the calf. Um, and they also like to refer to growth rates and see how they're growing compared to others. Uh, and that can kind of aid and add to a bigger picture. Um, and then some of them obviously look for signs of uh, sort of reduced intakes, not sucking, looking dull or diminished and demeanor, uh, coughing, labor of breathing, uh, taking temperatures and treating with Solaris if over 39.5 degrees. And others have said uh, taking temperature is the first port of call. They then look for discharge from eyes and nose and sort of rapid breathing. Those are sort of the first things that they look at. Um, but the calves, obviously, they've said they can, they're, they're in an area on the farm and they see them quite quite rapidly so I guess it's that sort of being able to to see them quite a lot and check them frequently which is quite important as well. Yeah and that, it's really interesting isn't it as that we start seeing that sort of the variety and and I suppose especially if we we take the analogy on the dairy farm it's just like this is a little bit like um, if we want to improve oestrus detection isn't it if we want to improve pneumonia detection it's about how often am I observing my calves and actually taking time to to look at them and especially those people on automated feeding systems where the risk is that you go in top about top up some milk powder and then you're looking at a computer screen actually spending time looking at those calves is going to be really important interesting that sort of people are making use of the respiratory scoring systems and for those of you that aren't aware of these systems um so there's a number of systems out there um there's the hey, these ones come come out of the us wisconsin's probably the original one has been around for the last 15 20 years and what that does it provides an objective way of looking at pneumonia and i i like them because i think they're a great way of um, explaining to people what you're looking for in a sick calf because i think we always underestimate the skill that there is in stockmanship and so if you're looking to explain to someone what a sick calf looks like this is really breaks it down into the sort of the little bits and the, the factors that you're looking for so for on the respiratory scoring system there if we take the wisconsin one we are taking we've got rectal temperature coming in there so we're measuring that and that gives us we get points for that we're also looking for whether there's a cough and whether it's there that calf is there just doing it on its own or whether it does it in response to being moved around or someone just stimulating the, the trachea whether or not there's a nasal discharge and whether or not it's sort of that yellowy one, which probably that more extreme sort of really sort of yellow discharge, which we frequently associate with more bacterial infections versus just there being a little bit more of a runny nose, whether there's discharge from the eye. And then we also take into account ear position. And actually, that's something that probably over the last 10 years within the UK has become more important when we start to look for signs of things like mycoplasma, which I think that's become more an established disease in terms of calves and that sort of has a predisposition to sort of go for the ear canal so that's where the sort of the ear dream comes from but these scoring systems uh, you give a, a specific score but for each animal for each um, each category you add it together and you get to a, a a total if it's over five that generally would be an animal that we would be looking at treating and it's for if you're looking at training staff if you're looking at making sure that everyone's on the same page it's a great way of going oh that calf am i happy with it it's a sort of that one that your eyes drawn to and i think this is the one i they frequently have the conversation with people there's something wrong with that calf i'm not quite sure what it is and it's nice to hear people reaching for the thermometer because that's an objective measure is it you're drawn to a calf that's not feeding doesn't look quite right a bit dull you go and take its temperature oh well actually it's running a temperature and that's a sort of right, that sort of gives you a piece of a picture. It starts giving you evidence that you need that something is wrong. You then look at it and you go, okay, well, actually it's got some 
nasal discharge as well, we're starting to build this picture that it's respiratory disease. Um, so those systems are really great. And, and we can do a nice plug here for the um, sort of what you've come out. And I think this um, scorecard has gone out um, as part of the, the pack and nicely demonstrated by my glamorous assistant there. Um, so um, I think this was AHDB and um, in association with VOLAC have brought this together. And I think this really, again, distills down some of the the key things that we're looking at. So sort of thinking about, right, what does a healthy calf look like? How do we focus on that early signs of disease? Because you know what? The calf that is not standing up, open mouth breathing, really sort of really struggling is very easy to spot. Actually, we want to we want to make sure that we are getting the animals in the early stage of disease. And scoring systems like this are really useful. So big plug for what's um, what's there and I think you can use that QR code as well to to download that can't you Laura? Yes yeah so if anybody wants to download a digital copy just scan the QR code but equally if you want a physical copy and you didn't get one of your delegate bags send me an email and we'll get one posted out. Um, just a quick one on uh, temperatures Tim someone's obviously mentioned 39.5 degrees uh, what would you say is a critical temperature for uh, making an assessment on a calf if it's got infection? Yeah, so I, I suppose where do we where do we sit? Thirty eight and a half to thirty nine is going to be sort of your your general normal sort of thing. So thirty nine and a half is generally sort of hey anything above that we would definitely be talking about is an is a good cut off as an ele, ele, really sort of an elevated point is a sort of if you're looking for one single cut off hey thirty nine and a half is a good point to start. Okay, and how can we improve that detection? We've acknowledged the fact that there's challenges out there. We're starting to see a real area of uh, de development. There's a lot of new technology coming out there, be that through feeding systems. So people have already acknowledged that actually they're using that sort of reluctance to feed as part of um, part of their detection mechanisms. And for those of you on automated feeders, it's really interesting that change in behavior that all that sort of um, number of visits, number of break-offs can really be an indicator of early disease and certainly that's an area where it's starting to, to pick up animals early on but we're also seeing that sort of interest in some of the technology that we've been seeing on adult dairy cows for a while so things like um, activity meters being used as a monitor for that, um, temperature monitoring technology be that sort of off the animal sort of cameras and things like that or actually on the animal in terms of ear tags and we're sort of there's a lot of research going on that there's a lot of sort of um, new tech being developed and it can be combined with sort of environmental monitoring so thinking about what's going on in that environment as well and it's great to see the technology that um, is coming out I think the, the key thing to do is when if you're looking at putting this kind of tech onto farm or you've got any kind of um, systems like this it's thinking again it's just no different from if you're chatting to your team and working out how do I detect a case it's going if I've got this piece of tech on my on my farm what does this alert mean and then what am I going to do about it and I think it's the it's almost the so what question and I, it's a sort of how I approach a lot of the technology it's going right so what and what am I going to do about it because that's that's the only thing that you're going to get value from from it so it's going right if this an, an alarm is shown for this animal what are you going to do about it because the challenge with some of the technology is it will actually pick up an animal very in the early stages of these so an animal breaking off feeding and it's great to see people using that in combination with temperatures is going right there's a number of things that could cause it to break off feeding so we have to be a little bit kind of well is this early scours is this early pneumonia is there something else going on with that calf so we have to be a little bit more targeted about what we do so making sure that you if you're adopting these which is great um, making sure that you've got a real robust treatment protocol to go alongside them and some of you may have seen this and I think this is an area um, that the vets more recently have got into and that's a way of how do I look at the lungs without having to open the chest which I ultimately have to wait until slaughter for so how do I see whether or what there's evidence of consolidation in the live animal um, and so we're, we're increasingly doing um, thoracic ultrasound um, this is sort of hey exactly the same machine that gets used for um, pregnancy diagnosis so most of the vets will have them in the backs of their cars and it's a useful tool and the 
the ultrasound of a normal healthy lung um, is actually very boring. Um, looks very similar to the sort of the one on the the, the top right hand um, um, sort of picture. There is the fact that what we end up with is because ultrasound won't go through air in healthy lung, all it does is hits the lung and then bounces off. So actually, you just don't see very much, and we just see two lines of the sort of the surface of the lung moving. So that's a sign to us the lung is healthy. When we start seeing consolidation, that fluid means that we can see further through the chest or we see pockets of pus or abscesses. And so it becomes a bit more exciting. But the normal healthy lung, it's a very, very boring picture. And ultrasounds being used for a number of different ways. Um, I think we can use it to, hey, if you've got a, a sick calf, it's going right. How sick is it? What what level of damage is done in those, those lungs? Um, we can then use it to alongside that to go, right, you've got this calf showing symptoms, but actually our other sort of calves in the pen affected. Um, we can think about following it back in terms of timeline. So in, on people re rearing heifer replacements, we're seeing an outbreak of disease at, hey, three months of age. We might go back to the sort of the two month old calves or the one month old calves to see whether we're starting to see symptoms earlier on, because that's when the disease is actually happening. That's when I want to focus my control measures. But we can also use it to follow up on treated animals. So giving an idea of prognosis and seeing how effective our treatments are being. And we also see it as people using it for routine herd monitoring, just as a way of going, right, how well are we picking up disease? What's the level of lung health? So something to chat to your vets about and sort of you may see being used, um, used on farm. So we've talked very generally about sort of that disease and um, what sort of symptoms it causes, but what's the underlying pathogen? What's the disease causing organism there? And there is a long list and I'm not going to sort of spend a lot of time sort of really focusing on each of the individual ones, but it's useful to understand that we've got groups of them there. So we have the viruses, so things like IBR, PI3, um, RSV, um, BVD, and um, interesting, there's a more, um, in, increased in, um, interest in coronavirus at the moment. Um, we then have the bacteria, so your manheimias, your pasturella, histophilus, and your mycoplasma. And for completeness, we have the the parasites that can control and um, cause issues as well. So lungworm, especially in that sort of those animals that have been out to grass. And the challenge ultimately is that we often see mixed infections. Um, and so it's how do I target my my treatment um, and my prevention? Um, so we are often in a point where there may be a viral cause first and then a secondary bacterial infection. Or actually, when we do investigations, we may have multiple things there simultaneously. But the key take home from this thing is thinking about half of the pathogens listed on there are never going to respond to antibiotics. So the only group on there that are going to respond to antibiotics is going to be the bacteria. So viruses, the parasites, so lungworm, aren't going to respond to antibiotics. So we have to remember that actually for those other parts of the treatment protocols are going to be more important. And yes, there's always going to be a risk that we see those mixed infections, but it does sort of add sort of that sort of importance to why do we give potentially antibiotics and a non-steroid or an anti-inflammatory as well is the fact that for half of the pathogens that we're dealing with, the antibiotics aren't going to be doing any, doing anything there. The the, the anti-inflammatories are going to be more important for those well, those animals with viral infections because they are going to help reduce the temperature, reduce um, reduce the, the the severity of the infection. So it's thinking about that as when we consider the sort of what's going on with the infections and how we go for our treatment protocols. Um, Tim, how is it best to sort of diagnose? Uh, if it's viral or bacterial, how can you work with your vet to to work this out? So it's bet so it, there's very very difficult, Laura, to sort of turn around and go right um, to look at an animal and instantly give. There's nothing out there at the moment that can go right. This is instantly viral. This is instantly bacterial. 
Um, so um, that is probably, that's the, the one thing that everyone is searching for, because if we talk about how do I really drive responsible use of medicines, is going, if I could instantly tell you by looking at a calf, this is viral versus um, bacterial pneumonia, we could be very targeted about it. We don't have that there. The vets are more likely to in, um, take swabs and say that what we do at the moment for a lot of diagnostics is taking swabs and doing um, PCR, so it's a lab-based test to, to understand what the pathogens are, but that's going to take a best time you're going to see 48 hours to get by which stage we'd have wanted to put some treatment in place. And this is why in a lot of cases we will still be using, we have to treat based on the potential for both, both infections being there. So when we consider the antibiotics, um, I have to tread very carefully here and, and unfortunately I cannot turn around and say right this is what a treatment protocol looks like because you do need to speak to your vet about prescribing based on what's around your individual farm but there are lots of different antibiotics out there um, and, and lots of different families so and you'll be familiar with some of them um, and these are sort of these are the groups that they fall in. So things like the penicillins, um, your tetracyclines, your macrolides would be often your, the ones that people are using a lot for pneumonia. And if we look across, across sort of what we have available within the UK, there are over 50 antimicrobial products licensed in the UK for the treatment of respiratory disease. So a lot of products out there are licensed so uh, do you have a claim for use in respiratory disease? And so it's really important that you work with your vet to make sure you're using the right product for your system or the risk of sort of the, the potential bacteria that you're, you're seeing. And they will be able to advise you exactly on which ones to go for. Um, I think in terms of where we're at as an industry, some of the products would fall into this sort of high priority, critically important antibiotics. And, we would definitely be sort of advising moving away from those. And these are the ones that ultimately antibiotics that have been highlighted as being the most important products for human health, um, strictest condi conditions around their use, and ultimately should only be used as a last resort where there are no other options available. Um, so for the UK, these probably would include your fluoroquinolones and your third and fourth generation keftosporins. And we, we've seen significant drop in this area over the last sort of five, ten years, a lot of people have moved right away from these and we're now in the situation where some re retailers, assurance schemes and processors have already stipulated these products should never be used in their supply chain. So this slide is in here for completeness, but you probably shouldn't be using any of these products um, for respiratory disease um, in, um, in calves. And what are we considering um, when we're thinking about choosing the correct antibiotic? Ultimately, all those families have different characteristics. So we are thinking about majority of the time we want a bit, we, we know that, hey, we've got that mixture of bacteria that it could be. Um, for a number of people, certainly, if there's a history on the farm or they're buying in stock, we're looking often for products that may have um, impact against mycoplasma as well to make sure that we, we address that as part of the sort of the selection. But ultimately, it is, it's working with your vet to ensure that you are picking the right um, white antibiotic to, to use as part of your protocol and then ensuring that you understand how that works and sort of what the sort of the dose rates are how long it works for because we do see these sort of that um, variation there in terms of what the courses look like what the dose rates look like and it's it's making sure that you and the team are completely au fait with that. And the term resistance gets bounded around a lot, um, especially when it comes to respiratory disease. And I'm not saying it doesn't occur, but um, I think it's really important when we're talking about respiratory disease, and pneumonia, to understand that actually that calf that didn't respond to that antibiotic treatment doesn't automatically mean that there was resistance to that antibiotic there. We've heard already that actually, a large proportion of pneumonia can be caused by viral causes. Ultimately, those viral causes aren't, um, aren't going to be affected by antibiotics anyway. Um, so we may not see a response to the antibiotics simply because there was a virus there and that was what causing the disease. Um, so 
working with your vet, understanding the causes is going to be really important. And certainly if you're seeing animals that aren't, aren't responding to treatments, again, it's that stage where you're having the conversation with the vet, you're potentially doing more diagnostics to understand, oh, is there resistance here? Or actually, are we, we dealing with a bigger problem that we need to address in terms of viral challenges? Or what can we do to address that problem holistically? Um, but there are going to be a number of reasons that that treatment might not be successful. So the antibiotic, if we've got a chronic case, so that case wasn't picked up early enough, the damage is done in the lungs, so it's it's never going to respond to treatment, or the antibiotic is actually going to struggle to get where we need it to get to. Um, if the animal was um, immunosuppressed, so we have things like BBD and things, ultimately we can be in a situation where it's not able to mount its own defense and we, we're reliant on that as part of the recovery process. If we're not making use of other supportive therapies, um, we're more likely to see sort of um, treatment failures as well. And so lots of reasons why we may see treatment failures, but it's going to be that key question. If you're seeing animals not responding to treatment on farm, on your first line or whatever it is, when you're doing your antimicrobial re review or when you're talking to your vet about how do you manage cases, that's the prime time to be having those discussions going, right, if they're not responding to treatment, what's, what can we do to, to better that treatment? Is it making sure that we're getting in earlier? Is it changing the product? It's, those are the time to have those conversations and it's all about working together to optimize that. Because as I said, there's lots of different products out there, it may not be down to resistance, but it may be a case that we need to look at other control measures as well. So alongside um, antibiotics, um, we mentioned them right at the beginning. So the anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, so most of you will have come across these and sort of we talk about NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory anti drugs. Um, and these have been um, introduced to a lot of respiratory disease treatment protocols with the aim of providing pain relief, reducing temperature, so reducing that fever and managing that inflammation. because that area of consolidation and sort of that lung damage, um, it's caused in part by the, the, the bacteria or the viruses that are, are getting into that lung, but it's also partly caused by the sort of the reaction that the body has to, to those. So there's almost this chain reaction in terms of the infl inflammation causing some of the damage as well. So why are we adding in those non-steroidals? Ultimately, as we say, if we've got viral pathogens there, our antibiotics aren't going to do anything. So the only thing we can do is sort of provide that supportive care. Hey, that's the same as you taking your paracetamol, your sort of um, your sort of your neurofen your, when you've got a what got the flu. It's a sort of how do you make yourself feel better? Um, it's providing that supportive sort of um, therapy there to reduce temperature um, and that sort of things to help reduce coughing. Ultimately, help us reduce that damage that's being done to the, the lungs and that um, lung damage. Pain relief. Any of you that have had had COVID or any kind of pneumonia will ultimately be able to relate how painful it is. So, we lungs move in a very kind of it's a very slick movement, um, and that sort of movement is constantly happening to help the sort of the movement movement of air in and out of the body. If as soon as we get any kind of damage there and sort of fibrosis or any kind of roughening of the surfaces, actually that becomes an extremely painful process. So that the, the pain relief is really important as part of this, because what do we want those animals to do? We want them to re return to normal feeding behavior. We want to reduce that long term impact um, of the disease. Now, Tim, just before we move on, I've had quite a few questions come in and I was sort of holding on till we got to this section because they were quite relevant. Um, I have had someone ask how many times uh, should one be giving non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to calves with a low temperature before you might consider giving antibiotics if you're not seeing any sort of improvement? Um, so I think that's an interesting one. And again, I think probably um, my, it, it would... Again, I would discuss anything with your vet and make sure it's how they envisage those products to be used. Um, I'm going to sort of, some of this will be answered by the, some of the conversation about this next slide. And I think um, I my view on it, if you're picking up disease early enough, you may just go right that single dose of anti-inflammatory. So if you're going, we're going by feeding behavior, 
um, we've got um, you've got very good detection because you're either getting information from fee automatic feeders or you're really hot on your sort of detection there and you're picking up animals when there's no other symptoms and just a high temperature. I've, my, my view on a single dose of an anti-inflammatory at that stage, um, you, you can, um, can try at that stage, but those animals I would always be marking for follow-up. And so I would probably, if you're not seeing a response after that dose, when you suddenly go, we're still seeing an issue, certainly with 24 hours after that, I would probably be looking at where, where do I go in with my, um, my sort of my my further treatment so be that an antibiotic or whatever but i would think it's a conversation to be having with your vets on that front and there was just one more just before we move on which was what can i give a calf at the first signs uh of just feeling a bit off feed and with a slight temperature which hopefully will link into what we've just been speaking about yeah so and i think that's probably where this is where those that very early detection um that's where i would be looking at that would be sort of looking at sort of an anti-inflammatory uh, but have a word with your vets and i think it is thinking about when you when you're having those conversations what's the key thing and it's the the key the, the points we're talking about today and um i have to say apologies i have under legal things of where it sits under my duty of care is not i'm not prescribing here so i have to be very careful about what i say but there is very much this if the the, the role of anti-inflammatories in that early part of the disease say that animal that we has a fever a, a slightly off feed it's almost if i use the analogy think about what you would do if if you're feeling slightly under the weather you go to your medicine cabinet and you go you might have a lemsip you might have a neurofen that that's it's that kind of circumstance if the animal is getting worse then it's it's but it's it's then thinking right what do i go in with next but i think certainly that early um, um, sort of part of that sort of disease detection, an anti-inflammatory on its own could be an option, but it's speaking to your vet and making sure you've got clear ideas of at what stage you would then follow up and go, how long am I going to give this animal before I then go into um, making sure that I then address the potential for a bacterial infection. And obviously you mentioned sort of reference to, I suppose when we're sick, we would think of LEMSIP, uh, oral hydration actually um, something we haven't spoken about today in terms of treatment how important do you think it is to be offering extra sort of rehydration therapy to aid with recovery yeah and, and i think that's a really good point because i think it's it we often overlook it don't we it's thinking about how do i actually provide that sort of that that nicer environment to that calf so that animal that is off its feed hey providing sort of oral electrolytes are going to be a positive there it's going to be um, especially if, if we can get away without having to tube them and stuff like that, hey, offering it as a as a way that they can just if you've got warm electrolytes and they're going to take from a bottle or from a from a bucket, actually it's going to help them. It's a sort of that that it will just provide that a bit extra energy, sort of help them fight um, um, fight the infection. So you're never going to do any harm with that. I would always be a little bit careful if you if you've got a down animal with, with respiratory disease and it's struggling struggling to breathe be very very careful if you're then going to have if I would be hesitant about tubing it or anything like that because you can imagine the stress associated with that but anything that you can do to su provide supportive therapy so it may be that right that calf comes out of a group just so that it's you can provide a warmer environment for it you provide it with a coat you provide it making sure it's out of a draft if it's outside you're bringing it back in it's a sort of that supportive therapy is going to be a key part so almost following on from one of the questions there that it's almost someone knew what my next slide was going to be was there is that increased interest on sort of whether or not we can use the non-steroidals on their own um, this was a trial from a couple of years ago where they looked at making use of technology so that using fever as a indicator of potential disease um, so these had um, ear tags that were going to flash when they had um, an elevated temperature and what they did was they used those as an indicator so animals that suddenly had a fever they were given an, an anti-inflammatory and no um, no antibiotics what they then did was follow those animals and what they looked at what they found was that of all the animals that were given the anti-inflammatories, 25% of them that were treated showed resolution following only non-steroidal treatment. So one in four of them, that was enough. 
that single that single shot was enough so that was enough for them to fight it off on their own and they didn't see any um, detrimental effect on daily live weight gain on the flip side of that what does that tell you three quarters of them did need a follow-up with the antibiotics um, so it is being very careful in this area about sort of um, making sure that we are not holding off antibiotics where we are actually going to need them antibiotics is always going to be that we need to use them in certain cases and that we have to be we have to make sure that we're getting them in at the right time but there is that potential opportunity if you are very very tight on your disease detection you can pick up very early cases you're then going to be making sure you're observing those animals um, regularly and following up on those cases, there is that potential that for those animals, it might be um, might be okay for you to give the sort of the anti-inflammatories on their own. But you do need to make sure that that's part of a holistically agreed treatment protocol with your vet. But I think that sort of hopefully answers some of the questions that came through, Laura, because it's sort of really I sort of there is this kind of there's opportunity there, and I think as technology gets better, that may be where we see more advance into this area where we're getting disease so early picking up disease so early that we can go in before we've got secondary bacterial infections but i would always be a bit wary if we've got an animal that has really severe signs even if they come on very rapidly so nasal discharge real severe coughs and the sort of open mouth breathing i wouldn't necessarily just be going on with non steroids on own i would be at that situation even though you've only picked it up very quickly it is important that we are addressing all potential causes. So we've alluded to treatment protocols and I can't provide a standard protocol for everyone, um, but I can give you some sort of key tips or questions to go away and ask your vets. And hey, for those of you that um, haven't met, taken advantage already of sort of the animal health and welfare pathway sort of review visits um, there is funding out there sort of for having vets out on time to look at um, diseases and things like that and um, look at those control control plans and sort of do health review and you could use some of that funding to get vets out to have a to work with you on that they would look at doing a bbd screen as part of that but you could look at that as part of your calf health review as well but if you're thinking about treatment protocols it's what do we what do we want to make sure that they do first and foremost make sure everyone in the team understands them um, for some farms that it may only be you and it may only be you that looks after the calves and certainly on some of the larger dairies i know there's larger teams and it's important that everyone um, knows the protocols and that is from what to do but it's also about identifying the disease so we then work through if we've identified the disease i want to know what products or product we're using how it's given clear um, dose rates and ideally i'm a big fan of having these written out laminated stuck in the calf shed so you know it, it's not you're not having to hide sort of go through a health plan to to find them they are exactly where someone needs them in the middle of the night when they've identified that case so it's because if no one's going to go away and look up, look it up make sure it's up on the wall people know exactly what to do um, and some of the key questions i think we're not always as good at asking and it's come up in some ways some of the questions we've had today is thinking about when to retreat we we've got a lot of products now where we know that they last for hey 48 hours or some of these longer acting products are hey that single jab lasts for 10 14 days and that's one of the questions i often get is sort of thinking like it's like oh well so it still hasn't improved when do i go in when can i retreat and for those long acting products we are in a situation where it is the same as you have to view it as you're giving the antibiotic multiple times and it's as if it, it works exactly the same time as sort of having lots of injections over a seven day period there's no benefit from going in um, during that treatment uh, during that period that it's under treatment but it is um, agreeing with your vet what that jab that you've given today how long is it going to last when are you going to expect to see improvement and at what stage do you review that animal and go i'm not happy with this um, at what stage should we go right that first treatment hasn't worked when am i when am i going to retreat it is there a second line treatment that i can go on with that you're based on what you have or that, that you have prescribed for you or is it at that stage that you 
have a vet to look at it. So it's that I think that's the key area I would focus on. Probably everyone's got details in their protocols about what to give for a case, but I think one of the areas a lot of people can tighten up on is thinking about right, when do I review that case to make sure that I've got absolute resolution of it? And for those cases where I have problems, what's my next thing? Because there is repeatedly going at the same calf with the same same drug combination isn't always going to be effective. So it's agreeing that with your vet as to what's your next line of treatment. Um, and so and also reviewing that you shouldn't have to go into that second line, but it's making sure that you you have a contingency in place or you've got that agreed at the time. Because what do we want to do? Um, we want to make sure we get treatment success. Um, and we if we get um, we get treatment success, we want less sort of we want less sort of repeat cases. We and I suppose the key questions to ask when you're reviewing your immune treatments, are you seeing a lot of repeat cases? So animals not responding, and that again would be something to review with your vets. Um, and it's as if that's the point to look at. Right, if you've got cases that you're treating today, 48 hours later are still not responding, it's having a conversation with your vet about what's what your product choice is now currently, what's the what's the next option for that animal that you're you're managing, but how can we optimize that um, the success? And these graphs um, sort of almost summarize that sort of process that we go through, and we probably everyone knows it. We get really good generally get good response to first treatment. So if you pick up pneumonia early, we get about 82% of animals will respond to that effectively and we get complete resolution. We then sort of get to a point where if we take the sort of 15% of animals that are then treated for a second time, out of those, about 65% will respond to that treatment. So we're already getting to that, so if we're going in multiple times and treating multiple times, our success rate will drop off. So we've gone from 85 down or 82 down to 65. We then retreat the sort of 12% of animals that have had two treatments already and need to be retreated. Our success rate on that third treatment already drops to about 30, 30 to 40%. So we really, if we're starting to get to a stage where we've done one treatment, another treatment and another treatment, we are getting to the stage where the, the likelihood of a positive outcome is sort of is 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 much lower and luckily if we think about percentages the number that get to that is very is very low if we've got if we've taken 100 calves we go right 80 85 have responded in the first time round and then 60 percent of the ones we've retreated have then responded we're actually only talking to a few calves that ever get to that stage of needing repeat treatments. But by the time we get there, those are the animals we all, all know as seeing as those chronic um, calves. And so if you're seeing a lot of those, it, I would encourage you to review with your vet about um, your treatment protocols, how you are detecting your, um, you're detecting your animals and making sure that those animals are um, being picked up and treated rapidly. Because the one of the biggest causes of um, treatment failure that we see on farm is probably that delay in identification and treatment. And bear this in mind is that everyone will market drugs to you really in sort of go, oh, this is really effective. It will get to the lungs in within 30 minutes of administering it. That's great. That's superb. Really, really fast product. But if it takes you six hours to identify that case, or you saw that case this morning, didn't have time to go and get the jab for it and we'll say, all right, well, I'll do it when I come back at lunchtime. 30 minutes versus the six hours in between when you saw the car for the first time and when you gave it the jab actually is insignificant. That the biggest determining sort of limiting step there is when you administered the treatment. So it is always thinking about if you see that animal, you identifying as needing treatment, go ahead and treat it there and then because that's going to be the sort of the, the big thing that you can do for ensuring what, that we get um, successful treatment. So that that don't delay treatment because all the time that we are not treating that disease is spreading around the group. We're also seeing that damage going going on to the in going on in the lungs. 
So Tim, I've got a question coming in, which actually might be quite uh, poignant here. Uh, what is an acceptable treatment rate per 100 calves for treatment of pneumonia? Just as you were saying, not delaying treatment so it doesn't spread. Um, is there a critical tipping point, um, sort of percentage wise, I suppose? Um, so again, it's a really difficult one. So we would probably, um, I, I would have dairy farms where you've got closed dairy farms where they are, you, you're not stressing animals out, you are, they're moving into a well-ventilated shed. And some of those people will be treating less than five calves a year per hundred calves. So it will depend a little bit on your system. For calf rear is where we know that actually we're bringing in multiple animals from different sources, we're stressing them out. Our, probably our cutoff and sort of our targets are going to be less than probably we we know that we're going to see a bit more disease because of the stress associated with what's going on so um, target wise I certainly would have people sort of less than 20% as an overall treatment rate um, for that um, but it is about um, again working on your individual systems and some of it is going right if you record your cases today and if you don't know it it's almost going right what is my what's my treatment rate for this year when you go into your medicines review, have that conversation with the bank. Go right. This is what to, this is what today was, or this is what the last twelve months were. Whatever that number is, how do we make it better? How much? How do I reduce it? Because this disease is going to have a negative impact. So, even if you're at five percent, hey, it's about how do I get it down to two or three percent. If if you're down up at the the twenty percent, it's how do I gradually reduce it? But it's it's understanding that certain units and certain farms will have slightly higher risk practices, hey, bringing in multiple different animals from different sources, we know that we're going to have a higher chance, um, but it's then going, how do I reduce the um, reduce the sort of risk? So again, the importance of the environment, how do I make use of vaccines in those kind of situations? So we've talked a lot about sort of treatment protocols, how we optimize them. The last little bit, I just wanted to touch on about responsible use of antimicrobials because I think it's a really difficult message um, and I think sometimes and I've been criticized previously because you sit on one hand going everyone wants us to reduce antibiotic usage and then I've just spent the last half an hour preaching to you about the importance of getting in and treating early and um, there is this there's a real fine balance and it is about when we're talking about responsible use of antibiotics it is as little as possible and as much as necessary is I think the key thing to use about it. So when we're talking about it, if we can avoid unnecessary use, that is the key focus. So the as little as possible is gonna be right, how do I reduce the risk of disease? So biosecurity, vaccination programs, good nutrition, um, making sure that we are um, managing that, um, that sort of, those risk factors of the environment and everything else. So that is what we're talking about when we're trying to reduce that um, that need for antibiotics but when we do need to use them we are using them in the correct way so correct doses completing the courses um, and again so that goes back to thinking when working with your vet going right if i've tried something today when do i review it because actually if i'm i'm going to have to go in and retreat that animal for, for whatever reason it's making sure that i am not leaving a significant time between when the cover from the last course ended and when I go in with the, what the follow-up treatment was. So making sure that we're not always sort of just going, oh, let's wait and see what happens. Um, so it is about um, making sure that we are, so that nuanced difference, making sure we're doing everything to avoid the need of antimicrobials, but if we are gonna need them, we get them in into the right animals at the correct dose rate as rapidly as possible. Because if we can stem that, disease spreading, um, we're more likely to see treatment success for that animal. So early treatment of that animal, we are going to avoid the likelihood of it going to needing subsequent treatment. So we reduce the usage of antibiotics there, but we also get to a stage where the sooner we treat, we sort of help reduce the spread through a, through a sh shed. And so what does that look like for pneumonia? Hey, it's the disease reduction strategies, so biosecurity, making sure we're using vaccines, good management and husbandry and getting the environment right, making sure it's the right product, right dose and at the right time. We, are, we do want to avoid that routine prophylaxis, so making sure that we aren't reliant on sort of 
going in and sort of treating batches of calves just after movement or anything like that and having the data there to make sure that you can go through with your vet and sort of assess how your protocols are, are, are working. And we've seen recently, um, so this was published about two weeks ago, the UK livestock sector has done a great job in terms of reducing its overall usage. So um, we've seen this massive drop from sort of hey, 62 milligrams per kilogram per PCU, so per animal unit um, on in the UK down to 26.7 so a massive drop and that's credit to the sector in terms of how we're going with um, our responsible use but diseases like pneumonia are still going to be there as those potential usage um, uses of the antimicrobials in terms of their management so we need to think about how do I holistically manage that so when we start looking at what's out there and you can see what are the drivers behind some of the grant opportunities at the moment with the, the sort of the the sort of health and productivity grants where there's funding out there for calf, calf um, shed improvements or new builds is going right how do we improve the infrastructure so that we can reduce the risk of these diseases further so that kind of stage of going like you know what we need to put animals in the right environments to reduce the the, the risk of these diseases but it's acknowledging that that's going to take some funding and that's where the grant um, current grant funding sort of opportunities come into play. And we've alluded to this previously, that data's there, it's great for the sector, but make use of your own data. And you are, for farm assurance, there is an expectation you do an antimicrobial usage review, and please just don't view that as a requirement for an assurance scheme. It's a great opportunity to get your treatment protocols nailed, get, think about how things are performing. So a lot of the questions that we've asked, the people have asked today, it's going, right, I've given you the very generalist answers, but actually these are the perfect questions when you, you're sitting down with your vet to go through, what did you use over the last 12 months? It's thinking about, right, how did I use that product? Is that the right product for that case? Um, is that treatment protocol working? Or if it's not working, when do I change it? Um, and do I need to change it as my first line? Or do I need to think about what my second line treatment would be? And your, your, the usage reviews are a great way of an opportunity to, to do that and think about how you make best use of those. Because, hey, it's also a good way of understanding how much you spend on antibiotics for pneumonia. It's sort of, I sit there occasionally, you, go, you catch up with people and they don't necessarily have, the record keeping um, is often harder to, um, to, potentially harder to go through it in a diary or whatever, but actually when you, you look through and you can go, right, this is what you spent on antibiotics for treating pneumonia in the last 12 months, suddenly it's amazing how rapidly that will add up and suddenly that figure, you then look at going, oh, actually potentially me investing in a, an air tube within my shed to increase the ventilation or uh, looking at vaccination suddenly balances and looks more attractive than, than the cost that sort of mounts up over time over a bottle of antibiotics and an anti-inflammatory and not to mention the sort of the, the impacts that they have on productivity. So use those reviews, go through, get your, get your treatment protocols in order. And as I say, key questions to think, review what you're, what, um, how are you currently using specific products? Are your, pro your treatment protocols working? Are there any alternative products? So it's always a good time to just to review and think about, right, is there anything new out there? Is there something better I should be used? And it's nice to get that almost a second opinion on, are, does your usage pattern point to any specific disease issues? Um, and think, think about that. And targets for improvement. We'd ask, ask about targets for pneumonia. That's the perfect thing to go, right, if I know what my case rate is for the last 12 months, let's target an improvement. And you can benchmark against other people, but actually even just taking what you did last year and going, right, I want to improve this year um, is a good starting point. And yes, we all want to um, reduce our antimicrobial usage, but it's how do we balance that by ensuring that, and ensuring that we are not compromising on welfare or productivity. Um, Tim, just had one more comment actually about the anti-inflammatories. Um, are there any particular drugs that you shouldn't be using at the same time as an anti-inflammatory? Um, so I think I would always be careful and let's say you're, all the drugs that you are um, using sort of um, will come with sort of specific warnings about it and it's a, that concurrent use. 
Um, so majority of the time, there's no issues with using a, an antibiotic and an anti-inflammatory together. Um, you need to be very careful about um, be very careful about your dose rates for anti-inflammatories because um, they do ultimately they're inhibiting a inflammatory pro uh, inflammatory processes, but that that inflammatory process and the cascade that that's part of is part of our normal bodily function anyway. So it's a bit, you can overdose on them. So it's making sure that we animals are properly hydrated and things. Certainly that's one of the big areas of concern is that we're not overusing them in dehydrated animals. Um, but I think I would be just probably, if you're given specific products, um, just make sure that you're following the guidance of Etsco. But yeah, so make sure you're dosing correctly. Don't sit there going, all right, a bigger dose is going to be better. Um, you don't want to overdose them because that can cause damage to the kidneys. It can cause um, issues with ulcers and things like that. Um, I would also just be a bit careful if you are using them around vaccination times as well, um, just because there is a sort of, think of what we're trying to do with vaccines is that kind of aspect where that vaccine is given for us to sort of try and get an inflammatory response. We're trying to get that kind of, that body to react to it. So we have to be a bit careful about using them at that time. But again, that comes into a discussion about whether or not we, um, you should be vaccinating sick animals, but your vet will be able to best advise you on any specific um, products that you're using that you just need to, to, to balance against that. And mentioned vaccines just there, I think, one of the key things that the industry is really focusing on in terms of controlling respiratory disease is that sort of um, increase in vaccines. And we've seen that through some of the lectures and I'd encourage you to look back. Today's been very much focused on how do I treat disease, but vaccines will be a key component for um, preventing disease. And it's great to see that actually over the last, um, last few years, we've seen an increase increase in the vaccine uptake in terms of in the usage in sort of respiratory disease. We've got some great products available there and you'll be able to work with your vet and sort of get a, a key protocol out there to sort of address the challenges that you specifically see. But yeah, worth having a look at the recorded webinar um, on the vaccines and sort of seeing where they could potentially fit into your, um, into your disease management protocols. And final slide from me, and I say we sort of gone on a bit longer than expected, but hopefully we've managed to answer a number of the questions as we've gone through. Happy to take any more. But I suppose, how do I look at optimizing pneumonia treatment on farm? Um, I think one of the key areas um, is, and the one thing that everyone I deal with, I think probably benefits from is taking time and thinking about how do I ensure accurate identification of affected animals? And that is, even if it's just going into the shed with one, every, very regularly with a team of pe the team of people that look over the calves and making sure everyone's singing off the same hymn sheet using the sort of scorecards as sort of Laura sent out and sort of are available for you to download. They're a great way of people going, all right, what are you looking for in a calf, sick calf? How do you identify it? And making sure everyone is 100% happy that we are picking up calves that are affected. Having agreed treatment protocols so that everyone knows that, hey, this is a case of pneumonia. This is what it gets. This is the anti-inflammatory, this is the antibiotic or whatever you decide with them, making sure that, that they are those protocols are visible. So, hey, laminate them, stick them in the shed, stick them by where the medicines are so that everyone knows exactly what's going on and that you're ensuring that that treatment is given quickly. And the, I always get asked, which is the best antibiotic for this? Is a site. There's so many choices out there and there's not one. The biggest thing you can you can do to probably improve it, and we're all guilty of it occasionally, is going, all right, I saw that calf. It didn't quite feed this morning. It's going, don't delay in following up on it. Don't sort of go, all right, I saw that one. Just it's like take the time at that stage to get the product into it because whatever, however fast a drug acts, it needs to get into the animal first to begin to act. So um, really focus on that and then review those treatment protocols. Be that with your team. So making sure that everyone's 100% familiar with what you should be doing. And then also with the vet, feel free to challenge them. Say, we, I regularly go through a lot of my treatment protocols with people to make sure that we are happy that we know the products are working that they, everyone is getting the response that they want to. And that actually, as I said in the earlier on, it's thinking about, right, if we get to the point that the sort of the antibiotic and the anti-inflammatory are no longer in the system, what are we doing next if that animal isn't 100% better? And 
much as I don't want to undo everything that I've said in t today's talk, which is very much focused on treatment, ultimately all of us hopefully on this on on the call would turn around and say we would prefer not to be in a position where we're treating at all so i think that focus on prevention is going to be key as part of your holistic approach to to pneumonia so think about what you're doing to promote the immunity so colostrum potentially vaccination but making sure we're feeding animals appropriately and all through that um, and then making sure we're getting the environment right vaccines as well so really focus on that so i will wrap up there i'm happy to take any more questions if there are um, any laura but yeah thanks to everyone for your attention no thank you tim uh, i have had a couple more coming in uh, someone has just asked about using a straw chopper to do with particulates um, and how this can obviously you know how how much is it is it stirring up pathogens or is it actually the dust particles that are causing causing aggravation? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good question. I suppose the way to look at a straw straw chopper is realistically, it, it's not going to stir up pathogens because most of these pathogens that we're dealing with are, they're not necessarily, they're not stored in the straw. It's going to be the, du the dust, dust aspect. So if we are aerosolizing a lot of dust and we're putting out there, what does that dust do? That, that gets it ultimately, we deal with that in the same way that we would deal with and the cars would deal with it is the fact that it gets dealt with in the same way they were they're using the defense mechanisms to get that dust out of their lungs so it's we are overstimulating that so if it's throwing up a lot of a dust there is a risk factor there um and i was one of my farmers always told me a story about it when he went to look at purchasing a um a straw chopper and he he went to stand in 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 the calf shed when someone was going going through with the go using it and the, the guy driving the shop ch is like, what on earth are you doing there because you're about to get his well, well that's what you're doing to the calves and it, it, it is thinking about put yourself in the place of the calves it's not going to be the nicest environment for that sort of that respiratory health and the sort of the risks for it so if you can have ones that are less vigorous or you could do it with the calves out of that environment it will you will take that risk away all right and um one really quick one about humidity and calf housing um should the level sort of be the same year round um or should it actually be fluctuating with the seasons so humidity is a really interesting question like if we follow humidity in most of the calf sheds we um we are a <laughs> much as we don't like to admit it there's a lot of moisture around in the UK anyway we are we are like if you mon monitor your humidity on a, any on a measure it's going to fluctuate dramatically and and that will that's going to change all year round I suppose what my way of looking at it don't get obsessed by individual values it's thinking about how do I reduce moisture in that shed in the first place because that we're not going to be able to hey look at what we've had with the weather in the last two weeks i can't control that it's can think about what you can control so it's thinking about right if i've got that weather outside how am i stopping any of that getting into my shed but it's also thinking out the base principles going right getting your drainage right and getting fluid out of the sheds making sure you're fixing any leaks in the roof drain pipes water troughs those kind of things but also thinking about what you're doing. So I'm a big fan of hey, people, especially when they're feeding younger calves, if you're doing milk feeds and you're doing prep for those, try and do them away from the from the shed, from the shed, where the calves are held so we're not adding extra moisture into it. So I think you will see humidity vary dramatically and that's a function of the weather that we live in. It's almost about, right, how do I do anything? Anything that we can do to reduce it's gonna be is going to be beneficial because that liquid in the air is what allows that bacteria or those viruses to to sort of survive in that environment for that that bit longer oh well brilliant thank you um i will wrap up here actually because we have run nearly five minutes over but we've had some really good questions which i think is always what what um sort of creates a good good uh on screen time. Um, just to highlight to everybody that uh, we do actually have two more webinars left in the session. So tomorrow, as Tim mentioned, we have the lung postmortem scanning. And then the final sort of uh, webinar is actually going to be the introduction of one of our new strategic dairy farms. Uh, Adam and Holly Atkinson will be going through their story and what they've done on farm, uh, sort of by utilising sheds, changing sheds, how they've been able to dramatically reduce the rate of pneumonia on their farm. And as Tim said uh, previously, just for the last one, we have 
uh, had uh, Jamie Robinson and again Sophie Mahindran and, and David Bull do two separate webinars looking at the environment and humidity. So if anyone wants to find out more about those, uh, there's actually a QR code that you will be able to scan. Uh, I'll just get to the next slide. So anybody there, just scan that QR code and that will take you straight to our page and all of the recordings will be on YouTube so you can watch those at your leisure. But uh, thank you for joining us, Tim. And I think, you know, looking at it all, wrapping it up, you, you kind of summarised it nicely, but I, I think it brings it all back to that measure to manage mantra, doesn't it? Um, measure what's happening on your own farm, whether it's in the environment, uh, whether it's within sort of respiratory disease rates and, and see how you can improve on that because if you don't start measuring it, you can't sort of manage it to help on farm. But thank you for joining us and thank you to everybody at home watching. I hope you've had a great evening and any other questions, please feel free to send those in. Thank you.